<laughs> All right, here we go. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Oh, wow, this is an exciting turnout. I'm so happy to see so many people here today. Um, before we get started, uh, just one little maintenance note. Please make sure your phones are either off or set to silent, uh, just as a courtesy to everyone else here. Uh, so. Um, my name is David Lotch. I'm the genealogy librarian here at the East Baton Rouge Parish Library. We're located right up there on the second floor. If you come in the front doors and look up and see those fancy chairs, that's us. Um, and I'm going to talk a little more about that in a few minutes. Uh, but first, as we get started and settled in, I want to share some exciting library news that was just announced today. As of August 1st on Tuesday, the library is going fine free. Yes. No more literally nickel and nine a year. <laughs> um, that doesn't mean that you won't be billed. What's going on? Hitting an echo. That doesn't mean you won't be billed if the material is. Um, what? Is that it? Okay. Yeah, so, but if your uh, material is, you know, way overdue, they'll still bill you if it's lost or, you know, messed up. But anyway, no fines as of August 1st. So, that's a great relief for us and probably a great relief for you. Okay, getting that out of the way. Uh, for a note on language, uh, we're going to be looking at documents that were recorded in the past particularly from the era of American slavery. And they were written by people, white people mostly, who were deeply invested in the politics of enslavement. And uh, some of the terms now sound offensive, uh, but remember we are quoting people who did terrible things, and of course they used terrible language to do it. Um, so please bear with us, and I know this is a difficult topic. So let's get going. I'm going to talk today about genealogy at the library. That's going to be the main focus. Uh, we are a division of special collections, which is located on the second floor, right over there, uh, where you come up the stairs and turn around, or you get off the elevators and turn right. We'll be right there. We have some displays up about this. We also have some material. And we also host the Baton Rouge Archives which include uh, the Advocate Photo Archives, which is every photo taken by an advocate photographer, the Baton Rouge Advocate Photographer since 1950. We're very proud to have that. Uh, we also have the Buckskin Bill Collection. So when he died, his family donated a lot of his memorabilia to us. We have old newspapers. We have uh, lots of Baton Rouge um, ephemera, memorabilia, that kind of thing. And uh, we also have a lot of local clubs and societies also keep their material with us. So if you want to do a history, say, on the Baton Rouge Little Theater, that sort of thing. We also have maps, all kinds of stuff, just archival stuff. But most importantly for us today, we also have the genealogy collection, which is several tens of thousands of volumes, uh, microfilm, and um, electronic things. And I'm going to talk about those in a little bit. So let's start with, uh, how did I get here? Uh, my wife is currently studying to be a mental health counselor, and she would call this um, a cultural call out. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about how I got here, who I am, my connection with this material. So originally, I am from a small town in Ohio called Oxford, Ohio. Uh, it is a college town, for those of you familiar with Miami of Ohio, that's where that's located, right down there. As you can see in the bottom left-hand corner of Ohio, I could ride my bike to Indiana as a child. That's how close I was to Indiana. Um, nice little college town. So, but what I want to talk about is the narrative that we were taught in school uh, concerning slavery, enslavement, Jim Crow, and race relations. And so, of course, this is the northern narrative. Uh, we were taught that slavery and segregation were southern problems. This is just, you went to history class, this is what you were told. And these problems were, of course, solved by Northern intervention. Now, 
you understand that's a deeply problematic attitude, a very patronizing attitude. Um, but that is what we were taught. For example, uh, we were taught heavily that the Freedom Riders did their training at Western College, a now defunct college located in Oxford, Ohio. And that's true. That's where they did their training. Um, so, you know, we're special. <laughs> we're part of that. And also, of course, the Civil War is also, you know, the North correcting the South. That's basically what we were taught. Um, and we were also taught that we know nothing, and this may have been true in the 70s and 80s, that we know nothing of the identities of enslaved people because nobody wrote their names down, nobody wrote or recorded anything about them. I now know that's not true. It was probably not true at the time. Um, but that's what we were taught. And then, you know, that subject's done and dusted. Let's move on. You know, so it was a way of sort of writing a huge part of our history out of history. So that's where I came from. Also, my family tradition said that we are a northern family and you know, with roots in Vermont, Ohio, Illinois, later Missouri and Massachusetts, and that I descended from German immigrants who got here after, 19, after 1865, excuse me. So, of course, my family is not implicated at all in any of this. This is what I was told. <laughs> uh, by my own parents. Uh, but my genealogy journey as I got into the roots of my family, dug deeper and deeper, and got more and more sophisticated, uh, I has altered this story for me. And I'm going to talk a little bit about a man named Henry Langford, or Langford, who was born in 1785 or so, died in 1856, and is my four times great grandfather. My grandmother's, I don't remember, but anyway, on her side. My paternal grandmother on that side. And the first record I was able to find, the oldest record I was able to find, he was married. He married a woman named Nancy Patterson in Georgia in 1809. By 1820, he was in Nashville and lived out the rest of his adult life in Nashville, Tennessee. So guess what? My family has a southern branch. No. So here we are. This is the 1830 census. Uh, on the 1830 census, uh, the head of household typically the man, got his, was the only one who got their name recorded, and everybody else was written as a tick mark or a number across the page. So you see living with him, there's a young boy between five and 10. Okay, and on the left side of the page, of course, because this was 1830, uh, is white people, and then on the right side is black people. So enslaved people and free people of color. Um, so living in the household, there's a young child, there's a child from 10 to 15, six young men between 15 and 20. So I'm guessing it's either a rooming house or because he was a builder, uh, those may have been apprentices, etc. So, And one of those, of course, is my great, great, great grandfather. So that's a lot of people living in the house. Well, there was division of labor in those days. Women did women's work, men did men's work. So let's look at the right-hand side of that page under the column slaves, females. Two lines down, you'll notice these two lines down. That's two lines down. We see a young girl under 10 years of age. There's a tick mark for her. And one young woman over 10 and under 24. Two enslaved people living in the household. That's all I know about. Two tick marks, but they have really changed the way I think about my family, family history, um, who I am, how I got here. Um, but that, because that's the way the records were kept, and because Nashville has been very cagey about putting their records where I can get to them, minus a trip to Nashville, that's all I know. Two tick marks. What I don't know, I technically don't know who their enslavers were. I mean, I'm not naive, I have a pretty good guess. <laughs> but I haven't found the actual record that proves it. Uh, I don't know their names. I don't know when they arrived in the household or when they left the household. I don't know where they came from, where did they go? Did they die? Were they sold? By whom? To whom? Don't know. 
and unable to, uh, unable to answer any of these questions, and I've been having a hard time uh, persuading my wife to go to Nashville so I can spend a day in the courthouse digging through old dusty records. And to me, this has become a genealogy for the genealogy of enslavement. There's so much information out there, and it is impossible or difficult, extremely difficult, to connect with living human beings. Um, and that is one of the things I hope we can cover today. That's one of the things that I hope our speakers today can enlighten us on. And one of the things I'm hoping to learn are methods and techniques for making these connections. So, this is my motivation for organizing today, is to locate, find out, or to locate interpret records of the enslaved, uh, and to bring, of course, all of you together with the same interest on how to do this and to talk about it. Uh, to listen to the stories that have been found in these records and then find out how we can bring more of these stories to light, how we can make more of these connections, how we can put more families together. So I've made this handy little chart, this little graphic thing. Um, on the left there, uh, let me explain this. Um, we have tremendous amounts, if we're going to talk about that, tremendous amounts of information about enslaved people. We have names, ages, family relationships, all kept in courthouse records and plantation records. And then we also have, starting with 18, the 1870 census or 1865, to today, tremendous amounts of information available through traditional genealogical channels. And what I've found is that little line in the middle there represents the difficulty I have connecting these two great bundles of information. So um, that's one of the things I'm hoping to cover today is try to make that little line a little wider. So. And here's an example of the courthouse record. When I say there's a tremendous amount of information, this is what one of these looks like uh, here in East Baton Rouge Parish. A man named John Gardner took out a mortgage uh, from a man named Bayless Hodges on April 23, 1831. And uh, as part of that mortgage, because, and I cannot emphasize this enough, enslaved people were property. Okay, cannot emphasize that enough. They could be bought and sold. They could be used to pay off debts. They could be mortgaged. They could be given as gifts. They were treated as property. And this is an example of that. So, he, he mortgages some land to Mr. Hodges, and then he includes the following people. A Negro man named Isaac, age 18 years. Peter, aged 46. Pat, age 49, and her children. Celeste, 14, and Dave, age 12. So we have names, we have family relations, we have ages. This is all tremendously good genealogical information. If you found this in a, a modern obituary, you'd think gold, right? But there's no other clue as to who these people's, what these people's identities were, or who they were after 1865. Also, um, just to give the idea of the scope of what we're dealing with here. These, in the 1870 census, when they published the 1870 census, they published charts of the historic censuses in every county that had done the census. And, um, starting, Baton Rouge first appears in the census in 1820. And as you can see, the number of enslaved people starting in 1830 begins to outnumber the, num the, the number of free whites to the point where in 1860, 55% of the parish was enslaved to the other 45%, basically. So a majority. And this, in East Baton Rouge Parish, that is a low ratio. Iberville Parish, 75% of the human beings in that parish were enslaved. And in Tensaw Parish, as high as 90% of the human beings were enslaved. And you can look this up, just go Google 1870 census reports, it's in there. It's not the easiest document to read through, but it's all there. 
So where do you look for these records? I'm going to talk, I'm going to boost my library, I'm going to talk a little bit about how to do the research, and then I'm going to let other people get in greater depth on how to do it, what's available, and what they've found. The first place to look, of course, is courthouses. Uh, as I said, uh, under the law, enslaved people were considered property. In fact, they were considered titled movable property, which means they weren't attached to the land for the most part, but, and they could be bought and sold, but you had to have a notarized document showing the sale. And that document had to be recorded at the courthouse. So if you go into the courthouse basement, right downtown there, they have notary records, judges' books, um, property records, and in them are included these sales, like that one I showed you earlier. Uh, a title movable is about the same legal status as a car, basically. So when you sell your car, you have to get it notarized, you have to uh, register the sale. Basically the same thing with human beings before 1865. Um, another great place to look for records, particularly in Louisiana, is at your local Catholic church or your Catholic diocese. Uh, the diocese, the Catholic Life Center over on Acadian has an archive, by appointment only. I used to just send people over there, and my colleague Amy over there gave me an earful one day about that. So yeah, make sure you call and make an appointment. Um, church members, of course, recorded their major life events with the church, births, marriages, and deaths. Um, <coughs> Catholic enslavers were encouraged by the church to baptize they're enslaved, and they were, there's a book of them up there, and they have more records over at the diocese, uh, individuals without surnames, they were called, basically. And yes, there were hundreds and hundreds of them. Um, Non-Catholics as well would sometimes register their births and marriages with the local church because there was no other authority, or you know, the county courthouse is so far away, you don't want to go there, so you'd register that at the local church. Some of those are in there as well. So, now I'm gonna promote my, my department, which is located right up there. I'm gonna talk a little about the electronic resources we have available, the print resources we have available. I'm gonna show you some fun stuff with one of the fun stuff with one of those. And then I'll talk a little about the microfilm we have. Right here. The microfilm is very complex to use. I can't get too much into it, but just know that we have a lot of it and we can show you how to use it. The most important place to start your journey with our library is at our website, ebrpl.com. East Baton Rouge Parish Library, ebrpl.com. Very easy to remember. Uh, I don't have my cards right now, but I'm gonna go grab those after this details. Anyway, and then you click on there where it says the digital library, and then by subject, genealogy, so digital library by subject, genealogy, and you get a list of all these resources. Some of them are historical, some of them are specifically genealogical resources, and we have quite a few of them that you can start with. <coughs> For example, we have access to Ancestry Library Edition. This is Ancestry, the one you see advertised on television. Um, it does not give you the ability to build your family tree on the website, but you can search all the records they have. Uh, it's free, but you have to be in the library to use it, either on one of our computers or if you bring a laptop and connect to our Wi-Fi and you go to our website, it's free. It is a huge database of government and church records. Enormous. Uh, also, it mostly includes census records. Those are where you want to start. If you haven't started your genealogy, a great place to start are the census records. Every 10 years, they went around and recorded the names of everybody. After 1850, everybody free people in the United States. And 1870 is the first census where they include the former the enslaved, all listed by name, all listed by relationship and location. Um, they also contain the Freedmen's Bureau records. Is everyone familiar with the Freedmen's Bureau? 
after the end of the Civil War, or as the Civil War was drawing to a close, Congress started this Freedmen's Bureau to provide assistance, monetary assistance, material assistance, education, um, job contracts to uh, the recently freed, the three million recently freed people, and also destitute whites. Um, and they wrote down everything. Who got how many barrels of pork, uh, who needed legal assistance, uh, all sorts of records there. So a lot of, a lot of human beings show up in the historical record by full name for the first time there. And many of the things on Ancestry also contain an image of the original record. So they have like, you know, somebody's written out what the record says, but you can look at the original record. And uh, Ancestry is really useful for tracing your roots back to about 1865, 1870. That's very, very good for that. And that's where I would start. We are also an affiliate library of FamilySearch. FamilySearch, you can get it home for free. Um, you sign up with an email and a password. Um, they, can, they let you build a family tree there. But um, there are three levels of membership. There's the one you get at home. There's the one you get at an affiliate library. And then there's the one you get if you're a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, the Mormons. It is a, the website is run by that church. But they, can, out of their kindness, let us use it. Um, and as an affiliate library, we have access to county level, parish level courthouse records. Um, so you don't have to drive over to whatever courthouse. Start here. Uh, you can't just, but they're browse only. So they're not easy to get to. We can show you how to do that. I don't have the time here today to do that. Uh, you can't just type in a name and find a record like that. It's one of these courthouse records. Um, they're hidden, as I said. But they include property records probate records, deeds, sales, trades, <coughs> gifts, mortgages, anything that would involve a transfer of property. And they do vary from parish to parish and county to county, and you know, which records are available, when they're available, how to use them. That takes a little practice. This is like a slightly more advanced than Ancestry, but it is a rich and wealthy resource. I use it now, you know, I'm getting more sophisticated in my genealogy. I use it all the time. And then another great resource we have available electronically are newspapers. Uh, if you go to the Advocate of Historical Archive under genealogy, and this is available from home, you can access every Baton Rouge Advocate and State Times in all of its incarnations starting in 1845 to the present. Uh, every time it's picking you starting in 1837, they're fully searchable. Natural language searches, you just type in the words you're looking for. And they include scans of the originals. So if you're looking for well, anything from like an obituary of somebody now to help you with your genealogy, all the way back to you know, whatever it is you would be looking for, news articles from 18, in this case, 1847, where we have a man named John Bastier who was picked up without proper identifying papers and committed to the jail in Baton Rouge. Uh, he's five foot six, 20 years of age, and he says, he says he is free, but they still put him in jail. So, because clearly he couldn't prove it. So, anyway. And then if he was in jail for two years they would, and nobody claimed him or he couldn't prove his liberty, he'd be sold off. That's how it works. Um, another great electronic, yeah, wow, yeah. <laughs> another great electronic resource we have is the Black Historical Newspapers. That database is on there and it's uh, post-Civil War, obviously. Um, but uh, it does include a huge database of African-American run newspapers from all over the country, including the Chicago Daily Defender and the New York Amsterdam News. Um, because of the Great Migration, because a lot of African-Americans were moving into northern industrial cities at this time, especially in the 20s, 
um, they, were covered, they covered events going on in the Deep South. For example, uh, this baseball game that took place in Baton Rouge in August of 1921, where someone named Owens, who played for the, that's a really bad scan, I'm sorry, uh, for the Fred Caulfield team out of New Orleans, which is a pretty famous uh, African-American baseball team, uh, threw a no-hitter at a game here in Baton Rouge, and that made the papers in Chicago. So, you know, and there was, later on there became a daily column in the paper, a Baton Rouge column where somebody would just cover social events, graduations, marriages, all that sort of thing. That, that comes a little later. Now let's talk about some print resources that we have. Like I said, we have about 10,000 books. Um, they cover everything from you know, genealogies of New England families, family histories, by the way, if anyone has a family history that they've written that is in a form that I can put on my shelf, it could be a three ring binder, uh, bound, whatever, I'd love to have a copy of those. I'm collecting those as um, a literary, I guess, genre, and also as a research tool. Um, but the one I want to point our attention to today uh, is called The Slave Narratives. Um, the WPA, the Works Progress Administration in the 30s, in an effort to collect what they saw as a fading folk tradition in America, it was spread out all over the country, recorded musicians and oral histories, and one of the things they recorded was the stories of people who had been born into slavery or slavery adjacent or shortly after. And they collect these stories. There's thousands of them. Now, keep in mind, these people were in their 70s and 80s at the time. And, you know, memories fade, ideas change. So, but they do contain great genealogical information and details on the daily lives of the enslaved. Um, there's 19 volumes we have on our shelves uh, from every state that they could find in the U.S., northern states from people who push north, um, southern states from people who'd stay where they were. Uh, for some reason, Louisianas are not included in that set, and they are at uh, housed at the Southern University Library and available on the Southern University Library website. And some of them then collected in this book here, Chain to the Land. They are transcriptions of the interviews of the people who had been enslaved. Uh, they're fascinating reading. And like I said, contain good genealogical information. If you're fortunate enough to have an ancestor or an ancestor's cousin or something who was interviewed in one of these Tremendous more amount of uh, source of information. Also a great source of history. For example, this is part of the narrative of a woman named Elizabeth Hines who was from Baton Rouge, but she had moved to Little Rock, Arkansas by the 30s. And she, this is some of what she had to say. I don't know the name of my mother's old master. Oh, yes, I do. My mother's old master was named Laycock. He had a great big farm. That great big farm, by the way, was called Goodwin Plantation. We're on that great big farm right now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the Laycocks, yeah. This, it stretched from Jefferson Highway all the way up to Greenwell Springs Road. It was about 2,000 acres. So the police barracks, all that north of here. We are on that land. And she says later, my father served in the army three years and died at the age of 110 years. He was actually 80. <laughs> 20 years ago, as I can remember. That's the reason I left home, because he died. He served in the war three years. He was with the Yankees. Plenty of these old white folks will know him by the name of Square Cloudy. That's good genealogical information. The name of his company was Company E. I don't know the name of his regiment. He got his pension as long as he lived. So I did some digging. I found this. I don't know if you can see it. This is a, an index card for a man listed as Squeer Claudie. 
Uh, and he served, as you can see there, in Company E in the USCT, the United States Colored Troops, in the Civil War. He was in Company E of the U.S. Colored Heavy Artillery. And then he was mustered out in 1867. Uh, they owed him $300 uh, for his bonus and $60 in back pay. And they docked him six and a half dollars for his rifle. <laughs> so he kept his rifle. And then, with a little more digging, there he is in the Baton Rouge National Cemetery, right up there on the corner of Florida and 22nd Street. That's his great marker. So he was buried with military honors. All right. So these are the kind of things you can do. <laughs> with just one little bit of information if you're willing to dig and work and search. And now I'm going to talk a little about what's available on microfilm. The microfilm is much more difficult to use. Uh, we'd have, probably have to set up an appointment with you and show you, walk you through how to use it. But we do have up there the records of the antebellum southern plantations in the 80s. Um, some researchers went through major university libraries, went into their plantation collections, and microfilmed everything they could find. Um, for some reason, even though LSU is one of those libraries, there's almost nothing from East Baton Rouge Parish in that collection. I can't explain it. Baton Rouge, LSU, Tulane, I mean this. So they are slow going. They're not easily, not easy to use. The indexes don't work very well. You have to sort of wind up going, find the reel you're looking for, and then go frame by frame by frame by frame to look for things. Um, but you can find amazing things. This is an inventory that was taken on a plantation called Berry Plains in 1858. And on the inventory for that plantation are these enslaved people. By name, age, profession, if they had one, and then um, assessed value, which, yeah, like I said, problem. Um, and it's fascinating, and they just wrote it down. Oh. Also, we have on microfilm a similar thing called records of the American slave trade, which are shipping manifests, mostly from Savannah, but also from New Orleans. And they contain, you know, any time a ship docked somewhere, they had to hand off the manifest. The manifest got recorded. Somebody has gone through and microfilmed all of those. Um, most of the people are recorded by first name, but they can be used. And then finally, of course, the most important resource we have, <laughs> us. <laughs> um, I accept the young woman on the right there. How, how good are we? That young woman on the right where there got hired away by the Dolly Parton Library. Uh, we were sad to see her go. She, yeah, she works for the Imagination Library in Knoxville now. Uh, but we have many, many years of experience digging through records. We know where things are located. We know all kinds of little tricks and this stuff. So, how to get in touch with us? Well. We're open the whole time the library is open, except we close 15 minutes before the rest of the regular library. And as I said, we're located on the second floor there, right above the entryway, you can see it. Um, our phone number is 231-3751, and I'm gonna have, I'll have my cards here in a few minutes. I'm gonna run right upstairs as soon as this is over. Uh, you can email us, it's very easy to remember, genealogy at ebrpl.com. That's the email address, we all get that email if you email it to that and then we'll fight or argue over who gets to answer that <laughs> also just so you know we have um, classes so keep an eye on the source keep an eye on the website we have a couple classes every month explaining how to use our resources or talking about topics in genealogy for example next month I am doing yeah, next month. I'm doing one on African-American sources in genealogy, kind of to go with this. And my colleague John is teaching a class on the newspapers that I showed you. So if you're interested in digging through newspapers. And we rotate them, we teach each one 
a couple times a year, I hope. But since we're down a person, you know, that, that, that might go off until we hire a new person. So that is all I have to say. I'm ending a little early. Do I have any questions, comments? Yes. Is there a resource to find plantations throughout Louisiana or anything like that? How do you mean? Uh, just a record, maybe. I mean, because we know of the ones that are still open right now that you yeah. But is there some kind of record for plantations that were here? Is there any way to find out which plantations were? I'm going to touch on that in my talk. Oh, okay. I'm sure you have a great answer too. I'm sure I do. <laughs> uh, that sometimes can be very difficult to find. Um, newspapers are a great place to find that. Uh, I don't have a database of those. I have not been able to locate a single database. Um, but yeah, property records will often list the name of a plantation. Um, sometimes, yeah, newspaper records. Sometimes they just don't go recorded at all. But, yeah. Yes, yes ma'am. The difference between a free, the difference between a free uh, Indian, mm -hmm. as a Cherokee, versus a free slave. How does that translate? In other words, if they're free Indian, supposedly they weren't enslaved, were they? Or were they just put on the reservation? How did that work? That's beyond my scope, I'm sorry. Pardon? That's beyond my scope. I have not looked into that yet. And the reason I'm asking that, I was doing something recently and just ran across it, that my grandfather was supposedly a free Indian. Mm -hmm. However, I found nothing regarding him being a slave, although he was born in 1872, 1882, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to know where do I go from there? That's, that's my question. So he was born in 1882. 1872. He was born in 1882. 1882. And he's a Native American. That's what the record says. Think maybe it would be in a dialogue place where he tried to. Yeah. Put in an application for admission. Yeah, that's. And he was named when he did a dialogue for the AWDS. Yeah. Those letters. Yeah, in the early 1900s, the United States government finally recognized um, Native American tribes as independent nations, but they had to, you had to sign up. And so there's all these rules of people attempting to sign up to join these particular nations. And that, that also includes, you know, genealogical information on you know, who are your parents, where are you from, who are your children. If they're located in that, not everybody signed up for that. Yes, sir. So the reference to an earlier question about locating plantations and, uh, mm -hmm. in Louisiana, if they would go to the frequent bureau records under labor contracts, yes. I'm just you'll this. find uh, numerous roles. And if you go to the beginning of the role, there are about 100 pages of all kinds of instructions on how to use. But what they had in there, although the labor contract for every plantation that participated, Immediately after slavery began around 1865, about 1868. And when you go to each parish, there are about three or four parishes on each micro roll, and you find your parish that you have a guidebook that will tell you precisely where, what role to look for if you're looking for a particular parish. And when you go to that parish, at the very beginning, there's going to be a listing of all of the plantations in that parish mm. participated. Mm. Uh, and then we accepted this on the plantation owners uh, who was in charge. They rarely would put those things together. And when you go to, if, if you don't, most of us don't know the names of the plantations because they change so so often. Uh, and so you have to you have to kind of put some things together. And oftentimes because of the change in in, in sales of plantation, the names of owners change too. So you have to kind of put those things together. But if you have the name of a relative, you can go down through, if you can look at the plantation, you can just look at the list, as the list of all the former slaves. And the labor contracts do something that's very important. The first five or six paragraphs 
refine the role of the former slave owner. It names the former plantation in the document. It names the former plantation owner or whoever is in charge in that document. And then at the bottom are the names of all of the former slaves that remain on the plantation, most of whom could not read or write, but someone with the frequency of their own legibly wrote their names. So that was really the first time most of them had a first and last name. And you can go down through that list, and it's a very useful instrument to use to follow up when you start looking at things like the 1970 census and so I'm sorry, I'm hard of hearing. Where did you say to go look for those records? Well, it, I believe he says that you have access to Freedom Bureau records. Yeah, the Freedom Bureau records. They're also, they're also uh, a whole list of those records at the uh, uh, the research library of the Secretary of State's office right yeah. down in Essence Lane. They've got, I think it's almost 100 or more uh, rolls. So you can yeah. use this. Now, can't you uh, access those records uh, at home over the using your library card? You can. Yeah, they're on. Well, they're both on Family Search, uh, and in the library they're on Ancestry. You can search them by name. They've been indexed. You can search them by name. You can name. access. It. You can still access the census from your library card at home on Family Search. If you're going to use it, pay us. I didn't know if it's changed. And also. Heritage Quest. Heritage Quest is another uh, we have. It's Ancestry Light. It's run by the same people, but you can get it at home. I'd like to make a comment about the plantations as well. Um, 20 years ago, I did a genealogy search in my family from New Orleans and um, traced back and found family members that came to Haiti and New Orleans were on, were on uh, Casalard Plantation. Interesting, one, once I started doing further research, found that this side of the family, uh, the plantation name changed after slavery to farm. So it's important to also start looking at some of the names of mm -hmm. farms yeah. because they were previously plantations. I yes. just wanted to add that. Yes, ma'am. A great graphic that you can get is if you look at the Persac map, yeah. Yeah. so and it's not necessarily going to give you a plantation name. It gives you the owners of the land, mm -hmm. and those little bitty orphans, yeah. high shape, yeah. along the river. That's that's a along the river. Yeah. If you find a where somebody who's from, you can at least yeah. go from that perspective of looking at the Persac map. Yeah, that's kind of seeing who is the owner of the land. Yeah. There was a hand over here. No? I didn't hear it. That the Freedom Bureau records? Yes. Yeah. Sorry. Yes. At the beginning of your presentation, there was a slide that showed the correlation between whites and those that were enslaved. Mm -hmm. Can you? Very quickly, go back to that slide, please. Okay. This is in the 1870 census. In the 1870 census, they published, as part of the census report, um, the previous counts in the census for every county, by state and then by county. And this would include, in the southern states, uh, white, free whites and enslaved. Actually, not just the southern states. It turns out in 1820 there were enslaved people in Ohio and New Jersey and other places you don't think of as slave states. But this is, like I said, this frees Baton Rouge Parish. And the point I was trying to make was, you know, by ignoring this part of our history, we're ignoring literally over half of our history in this parish. And it's something that we really need to look into. Yes, ma'am. Uh, you had a slide that on the right hand side there was a book called, I think it was Change of the Land. Yes. Um, could you talk a little bit about that book? This book is a collection of the WPA slave narratives uh, for Louisiana. The ones that are not incorporated into the big 19 volume set I was talking about. Um, the others 
are located at Southern University. They're available on the Southern University, the Southern University Library website. They are not easy to find. <laughs> the website is a bit of a mess right now. Um, but if you sort of Google Southern University Library online, Southern University Library slave narratives, you might be able to find them. So it takes some digging. They're not that easy to use, but they're there. And the original transcripts are there. You can read them as they were recorded. Yes, sir. I have not been able to dig into that. I've been working on it. <laughs> okay. Katie, Katie here is going to talk about that in her speech at uh, 2 o'clock this afternoon. So it's a reason for you to come back after lunch. There we go. There's a plug. <laughs> If you go to the library, uh, the library of Congress, there are some very old maps of Louisiana. There's mm -hmm. one that's 1820. And the next time they do it, I think it's like 1850s. Uh, they do not have plantation names on them, but they're color coded. They're beautiful, and but they and they do have landowner names. And so, you know, what you have to do though, you have to. Uh, uh, they have different resolutions, and so the um, better resolution, the better you're able to actually see, you know, the names of these owners, and it's for the entire state of Louisiana. Per se, you know, kind of focused on the locations along the Mississippi, you know, and um, the, this map is everybody. And so they go to, and there are a couple of others, but go to the Library of Congress. And, and, and do a reference for like a Louisiana map or a Louisiana reference map or something like that. And, and as far as this young man's uh, question about the Glen Meadow Hall's uh, database, it is online and you can access it. And, and, it's, and it's easy to play with once you kind of you know, work with it. It is on Ancestry, but I, I go back and forth. I, I, I'll try Ancestry and then I get discussed it and I say, okay. Alright, one more question and then I'm going to hand this over here. What's the best place to find sales of enslavement? Courthouse records. Courthouse records. They are frequently not, some of them are indexed, like East Feliciana Parish has gone through and indexed every sales record in all of their volumes, that includes land records, slave sales, etc., etc. East Baton Rouge Parish has not done that. They just have the land records. I am working on an index to the enslaved. I've been working on it for over a year and a half, and I've made it through about 20 years of them. There's lots of them. But yeah, you're going to have to go through. You would have to know the name of the enslaver, and then you just go page by page. It's tedious. Did you say East Louisiana or West Louisiana? East Louisiana has them indexed. If you go and you look at the records, there's an index in the records that shows all the sales. If you go to East Baton Rouge Parish records and you look at the index in the records, it's only land sales. You're going to have to dig through page by page because there are separate records involving enslaved people. Where, but, but I, like I said, I'm working on an index. Uh, I don't know when that's going to be ready. I have 
There's a list at the uh, Louisiana Archives uh, Department off of Essence Lane. Mm -hmm. yeah. If, yeah. Uh, for instance, uh, your person was sold late while this er territory was owned by Spain, yeah. they have some of those records there. Yeah. In my case, it went from the French name to the Spanish name to the yeah. English name. So if you can, you can look there and find some of the uh, folks as well. But from 1812 to 1865, it's a crapshoot. So, all right, I, that's all I have. We're going to have to move this along because I've been told that Ms. Gobert has a quite an informative, uh, Lenora Gobert, our next speaker, has quite an informative uh, thing for us. So I'm going to bring her up and we're going to get her set up here to take just a minute. But thank you. Thank Once again, you. thank you for coming thank today. Uh, we're going to bring up our first guest speaker today, um, Lenora Gobert, who works, and I'm sure she'll tell you far more about her work. Um, I first became aware of her with an art, from an article in The Guardian published in uh, 2022 concerning her uh, work uh, combating or against the, uh, expense, the extension of the Formosa uh, chemical plant down in St. James Parish and her work with environmental justice and using genealogical records to uh, work for environmental justice. So I'm just gonna hand it over to her and let her tell the full story. But please, welcome Lenora Gobert. Richard, you're on. Oh, yes. All right, I have a confession to make. I have not done a PowerPoint presentation in probably 20 years. So, and I have a lot of information, so I'm going to be going pretty quickly because I know all of you can probably read, so I don't need to stop and read stuff. And, and as I'm introducing each slide, we'll read and we'll move on, because I have a couple of very interesting videos. What's that? Group quarter. Oh, I'm, thank you. I have a couple of interesting videos that I want to share with you. Um, so let's get started. This, this story has a lot of moving parts to it. And it might be a little bit complicated about how this whole process plays out. And I hope I put the story together in a way that you understand it, okay? Um, oh, here's the mouse. Oh, here we go. Bear with me. Okay. So this is a story about David and Goliath. And it's a true story of how community organizations are fighting against a huge petrochemical company and trying to keep them out of the parish. So who's Goliath? Formosa Plastics Corporation. And Formosa Plastics owns what was the former Winchester Buena Vista Plantation in St. James Parish. And um, in 2018, Formosa wanted to do a $9.4 billion build out of their current facility in St. James Parish. And in January of 2020, the Louisiana, Louisiana Department of Environmental Quality, listen to that, Louisiana Department of Environmental Quality <laughs> approved air permits for the project. Okay, this is really important. So, who's David in this story? Our community organizations. And they are descendants of people who've been on this land for generations, centuries. Now, this is where we had a, a serendipity minute because there was a genealogy researcher, me, in the right place and environmental justice warriors at the right time. This is how I got involved in the project. I had been doing my own family history research for about 20 years. Um, I'm from Oakland, California, and I was doing it mostly online with a couple of trips to Louisiana. All four of my grandparents were born in South Louisiana, so it was highly focused in where I was doing my research, but I realized after a period of time that with all of the variety of resources available in Louisiana, civil records as well as Catholic Church records and all the archives and repositories, there's absolutely no way I could do my research far away. <coughs> I became so passionate about finding out about my family, my family's history that I had to come to the place where they were. I heard somebody go, mm, yeah. So I moved to, to New Orleans 
And the, the, the parishes that I am focusing on were very early on Orleans Parish, but mainly Lafouche Parish, you may not have ever heard of it. Um, St. Landry Parish, Opelousas, most people know that. Now in Point Coupe. So I'm all over the place and I do a lot of research in what I call the country parishes. Because everything outside of New Orleans, maybe Jefferson is considered the country, right? Mm -hmm. So um, in 2020, the middle, in the middle of 2020, I started working part-time for the Louisiana Bucket Brigade, which is an environmental justice organization, to do some economic development projects. Just some small project that the founder, Ann Rolfes, wanted me to work with her on. And it was right at the beginning of the pandemic, if you remember. But at that time, I had heard from Ann that some of the community members were saying, you know, we really need to know more about our ancestry and our tie to the land. And what, what Ann said to them is, guess what? We have a genealogy researcher on staff. That's the serendipity. I had no clue this was going to happen. I, I didn't go to the Louisiana Bucket Brigade to do this. But it happened. So who were the environmental warriors at the right time? Rise St. James, which was founded by Sharon Levine, and Inclusive Louisiana, which was founded by Gail LaBeouf, Barbara Washington, and Myrtle Felton. These ladies worked with other organizations, uh, law lawyers and those kind of organizations, to help file lawsuits against Formosa Plastics to stop them from their, uh, continuing with their expansion. And then finally, in September of 2022, a district judge put the kibosh on it totally by saying that Formosa had violated, uh, had two violations against it. So at that point, Formosa project stalled. Everybody was happy, but as you know, they have banks of attorneys that will come back at you. And so, you know, you sit around and wait for that, and meanwhile, you keep doing whatever you can do to fight them. So what was, what was their goal? Simple, stop Formosa. And later on, I don't have enough time to show you the full video, but <coughs> this is what's called Cancer Alley. And I know a lot of you have heard about these people who are in Cancer Alley. And they are tired of being uh, polluted, they're tired of catching cancer, they're tired of people uh, dying, they're tired of being made to move out of their ancestral homes because of all these plants that keep coming into the area, approved by the St. James uh, Council, as well as Louisiana in general, and the nation in general, because South Louisiana along the Mississippi River, that is the sacrifice zone for the United States. Yeah. Okay? So they want to stop Formosa. This is, this, and this is a fight that is um, unique. It's the first time it's ever happened. So, People wanted everyone to become aware that there were enslaved people buried on that land that was the site of um, Formosa's proposed expansion. A lot of articles written about it because, oh, that didn't look the way it did. <laughs> <laughs> kind of fell out of the squares. Okay, this is me trying to be creative, all right? So, um, so the knowledge started being disseminated about what was going on in St. James Parish. You know, sometimes you hear snippets of it, but you don't get the full story. But these warriors went, were determined to let everybody know as far and wide as they could what is going on there and that there are sacred spaces there and they shouldn't be just built over or eliminated. So what I learned up to this point, again remember, I'm, this is all happening before I get there. So what I learned up to this point was four things. That the community members were organized to fight Formosa. Formosa had gotten permission to expand and they had done archaeological surveys, which anytime any of these um, corporations want to build on the land out there, on these former plantations, they have to do archaeological surveys <coughs> to de determine if there are cultural resources there. And the third thing I learned was that there was a, gresh a regression analysis, which is key, and I will show you, a lot, show you a lot about that. A regression analysis was conducted on the burial sites of this former Winchester Buena Vista plantation. And the fourth thing I learned was that um, a local man who, who lives in New Orleans named Gary Winchester had traced his ancestry back to his earliest ancestor who was born in 1854 in St. James on, in and around the Winchester Plantation and that he had given numerous interviews about his family's tie to the land. So let's talk about these parts, they, each one that I learned. I learned that the community organizers were highly organized to fight Formosa. Being the director and founder 
and why St. James in St. James, Louisiana. St. James was once a small, beautiful community along the Mississippi River between New Orleans and Baton Rouge. Now, because of several cancer causing petrochemical plants along the river, our community has been nicknamed Cancer Alley. Despite this, the state has plans to expand this chemical corridor with more chemical plants. Rise St. James has galvanized the community in opposition of these polluting petrochemical plants and has filed a lawsuit against the St. James Parish Council and planned commission for its discriminatory practice of allowing these industries to be built near our homes. We have been successful in stopping a toxic methanol plant and a plastic plant from being built near a park and school in our community. These petrochemical plants can have triple the levels of cancer causing pollutants currently harming our two majority black districts from existing industrial plants and increased greenhouse gas emissions. Our fight is to continue to prevent new industries from located in our community, already experiencing high rates of cancer and death due to the pollution of our air, water, and soil. All right, so there are many ways that our, the communities um, were organized to fight for, for fight Formosa on many different levels. Okay, so the second thing that I learned was about what Formosa Plastic had done in terms of its archeological surveys. And as I said before, anytime anybody's going to build on the sites out there, they have to do archeological surveys to see if there are cultural resources there. Formosa did some surveys and what they found is there's nothing there. So for them, they could move forward. But under Louisiana law, cemeteries have perpetual <coughs> protective status. But first, you have to find them. Where'd my AV guy go? Because <laughs> it's coming up. And how do you do that? How do you find enslaved burial sites and how do you find out who's buried there? It's through something called cartographic regression. And I'm leaving that out there a little bit so you can read it because I'm going on to the next slide. I don't have a whole lot of time. The communities. Take the time you need. Okay. The communities worked with an or with a, a firm called Forensic Architecture, and I can see the URL is really obliterated. Um, and they are they are located in um, in the UK in London. And the the woman who's running the project is um, Jacqueline Amani Brown. She is from New Orleans. And what they did was they um, did an entire video of how people are being polluted in the in the areas along the Mississippi River. And um, then they show how they do a cartographic regression to show where different sites are on plantations from, they started from 1719 to the present, overlaying maps to show how they find out where these different um, sites are and hopefully burial sites. So. Oh, maybe it'll play. I am going to, this thing is 35 minutes long. And I had the URL up there because I would suggest that everybody watch the entire video when you have a chance. But I'm only going to show, should I show the entire video? Yeah. I'm only going to show the cartographic regression portion of it um, because that's what we're talking about right now. And I want you to understand the process that we went through, or they went through, this happened before I even came on board, the process that they went through to find out where burial sites are. They hire for-profit archaeological firms to serve in the field. We have studied over 50 field reports and have found a systemic lack of regard for antebellum black cemeteries. Formosa's archaeology firm found nothing to impede construction and Formosa's permits were approved. But members of Rod's new ancestral burial grounds were at risk. They hired a sympathetic archaeological firm to investigate and confirmed the presence of three cemeteries on site. Formosa Plastic has repeatedly searched in the wrong place for the burial sites on the Acadia property. Even when told to go back and look again, 
the fund that Formosa Plastics engaged looked in the wrong site. Okay. I'm stopping this here to say that Formosa Plastics was on the site of three plantations, Elina, Acadia, and Buena Vista. So they had already built on some of those, but they hadn't built all the way on the Winchester Buena Vista site. And so what she's talking about here now is um, the Acadia burial ground where um, Formosa had done this, their archaeological survey and they say they found nothing and they're saying that they didn't even dig in the right place, right? A thin ribbon was ostensibly laid by Formosa to protect the burial ground. But it bounds the wrong location. Even before Formosa broke ground, two of the cemeteries on the property had already been desecrated by prior development. Large gaps in federal law leave cemeteries unprotected in the face of state or private development. If allowed to go forward, Formosa's plant would occupy three plantations. Each plantation has at least one cemetery for its enslaved population. There are over 500 plantations across Death Alley of which over 200 are on the market for industrial development. Wow. Under Louisiana state law, cemeteries have perpetual protected status, but first they must be located. We're in a race against time to develop a strategy for recovering hundreds of missing cemeteries before industry breaks ground. To determine the probable locations of cemeteries, we need to travel back in time. We sourced and georeferenced aerial imagery from six decades. Using a technique called cartographic regression, we created a mosaic of each set. A picture of the past, prior to the era of petrochemical development, comes into view, enabling us to study the transformation of the land. To travel further back, we located, georeferenced, and analyzed 140 years of historic charts, maps, and surveys. We entered through a 1719 chart of indigenous territory, which colonists used to prefigure their genocidal dispossession. The land of the Homa people became the Homa's plantation. The manuscript edition of the U.S. Coast Survey charts the Mississippi River from Point Homas to New Orleans between 1874 and 1877. It is the earliest cartographic record we have located that depicts plantation components. The river, the forest, crops, structures, roads, plantation property lines, and plantation owners. And on occasion, it depicts cemeteries, albeit with an inconsistent symbolic logic. As with the aerial mosaic, we built the historic regional view, sheet by sheet. The 1878 edition of the U.S. Coast Survey covers approximately the same area. The absence of crops allows for easier analysis. The cemetery symbology in this series differs from the 1877 edition. Oh. You see, oops, I'm sorry, do you see the crosses on there? So they noted them on those early maps before they were totally obliterated. We need to travel back in time. We sourced and georeferenced aerial imagery from six decades. Symbology in this series 
differs from the 1877 edition. While some previously mapped cemeteries disappear altogether. The final map series critical to our research was charted in 1894 by the Mississippi River Commission. It offers an additional insight. Contour lines delineate the gradient topography, which slopes from the river's natural levee to the back swamps, from the high-lying domain of the slave master to the low-lying world of the enslaved. Despite their detail, the 1894 maps do not appear to consistently mark cemeteries. While a few are illustrated, it is unclear why most are omitted. Finally, we source property surveys, archival photographs, architectural drawings, and archaeological reports, which enable us to study the evolution of specific plantations over the decades. The maps reveal that plantations operated according to consistent organizational logics. To illustrate this point, our study is a composite of several plantations. The maps became the ground from which we grew structures as simple volumes. A plantation is equal parts industrial facility, farm, prison, death camp, and luxury estate. It was designed to enforce racial segregation, incarceration, surveillance, and forced labor. Capitalist tools wielded to maximize productivity and profit. We chose to fly past the slave master's big house and bring focus to the underrepresented back of the plantation, where black people were forced to live, labor, and die. Rows of cabins for the enslaved population were constructed along the main plantation road at a remove from the big house, surrounded by fields of cane. For the enslaved, each day began with the ringing of a bell to herald roll call at the industrial sugar facility. The facility consisted of a boiling house, a steam-powered sugar mill, and chimneys and vents which spewed smoke and steam into the humid air. Over time, plantations were mechanized and outfitted with the latest technologies. The bodies of enslaved people were treated as mechanical tools, tortured and discarded if they fell out of line. During the autumn harvest season, adults and children alike were grueling 18 to 20 hour work shifts in a race to beat the arrival of the winter frost. The frenzied pace was a product of the imposition of a tropical monocrop on a subtropical climate. Profitable cultivation of sugarcane demanded vast tracts of land, the clear cutting of forests for timber to fuel steam-powered sugar mills, and a large enslaved population supplied by the domestic slave trade and breeding programs. Interviews with formerly enslaved people testified to pregnant women laboring in the fields throughout their term. If an overseer wanted to whip her, they would dig a hole in the ground to protect the unborn asset. Some enslaved children were born in the very fields where they would work their lives away. At night, enslaved people reclaimed the paths of their daily toil, repurposing the furrows between rows of cane to move clandestinely across the plantation. To perform ritual, 
in the forest. And sugarcane became Louisiana's dominant crop in the mid-1820s. Cultivated fields expanded exponentially, and the primordial forest retreated, giving way to a rigid Cartesian grid. As the necroeconomy of the sugar plantation reorganized life, so did it manage death. Sugarcane was notorious for being the most dangerous crop to cultivate. And Louisiana's sugar districts were a negative demographic growth rate among the enslaved population. Slave masters would not sacrifice valuable land for black cemeteries. So enslaved people were interred in uncultivated lands at the back of the plantation, at the edge of the cypress forest. As cultivated fields expanded, cemeteries became isolated islands adrift in seas of cane. Denied stone, the enslaved relied on simple wooden grave markers, which decomposed over time. But sometimes they planted magnolia and willow trees to mark the graves of their loved ones. Isolated clusters of trees or uncultivated patches of land that interrupt the fabric of agricultural fields are referred to as topological anomalies. The memory of the land can be recovered through our mapping portal. Some there's more. I'm going to stop it there because we lost some time trying to figure that crazy <coughs> out. So, but now you understand what cartographic regression is and how it was, it, it was used. Now, those are the things, the three things that I learned that had happened before I started working on the project. And the fourth thing was this Gary Winchester's tie, his family's tie to the land. And he had given numerous um, accounts to the media about his family's ancestry and ties to the Buena Vista plantation. So my genealogy research questions were really twofold. If I could find out who died on the plantation, because we all know that there are various sites there, obviously we know where they are. And how or is Gary Winchester's ancestral line tied to the Buena Vista plantation? Can we give a direct tie to the present for somebody's family who was attached to that land? So my first task was to find out who the heck was Benjamin Winchester anyway. Well, we know that his family hails from Maryland, which GU 272, everybody comes from Maryland. And he purchased land that became Buena Vista plantation. He marries a local woman and he been, begins acquiring his enslaved people as early as 1820. My second task was to find out who are the Buena Vista enslaved people. And thank you, David, for setting such a great introduction because a lot of the things that you talked about are in this presentation. The first thing I did was go to the convent courthouse, which is the seat of St. James Parish, to look at the conveyance records to see who Benjamin Winchester bought and sold. Problem was, there were only a couple of these uh, books, courthouse books there because they had, the conveyance of books had been sent out to be digitized because now what all these small courthouses are doing are digitizing their some certain records, putting them online so that you can pay for them just to access them and pay to download them. So that's how they generate money for, their, um, for the courthouse. So I didn't have access to too many documents at that time, but I knew, as David said before, enslaved people in mortgage. So I immediately went to the mortgage books, and guess what, of course, they are in terrible shape, on a shelf, falling apart, because typically the people who maintain these courthouse records don't see them as valuable. They're valuable to us. We started going through all of the documents, in the mortgage documents and found out numerous, there were numerous document, documents for the Winchester family of their enslaved people that they had mortgaged over time. And there were so many that I had a couple of, of 
young people working with me at the time, one of who was um, a graduate of Yale Law School, but who became so enamored of the work that I was doing, she wanted to help me with this project. So she put together um, a spreadsheet of, so that we could track these enslaved people over time. And originally I just had a couple of conveyances, but there were tons of mortgages, and she put them in order. And in the meantime, while she's doing that, I'm thinking, okay, the Diocese of Baton Rouge, I know that they've done people with no, with no surnames for the Point Coupe Parish. That was fabulous. And it gives all the sacramental records of the Catholic Church for the enslaved people, which are um, not births, but baptisms, sometimes births, but mainly baptisms because these are sacramental records of the church, marriages, and deaths. Gold mine for me, right? They are doing the same thing for St. James Parish. And they have a database that they haven't published it yet, but they have a database of the enslaved people who, and I knew that they would have to hit the Sacramento records. Worked with Amy to get, the, to get that um, list of five pages of enslaved people. No deaths. And I couldn't understand why. Why would they not have deaths on there? So the, the, um, the archivist and I talked about it, and we figured out it's probably because Benjamin Winchester was not Catholic. And he was in an environment that required the sacrament of baptism for everybody, including the slave people, possibly marriages. But by the time he had these people, and for a while and they started dying, he didn't have to give them the sacrament of death. Why? He wasn't a Catholic. It didn't, probably didn't mean much to him. So none of those showed up on these records from Baton Rouge. So again, I was terribly disappointed because I looked at that as probably a gold mine for myself to find out who may have died on the, on the way to the plantation. But I'm undeterred in a lot of ways, so we keep looking. The third task was I wanted to find out what were the circumstances of the enslaved. There were all these people on these mortgage documents. What was happening to them? So I found that there were a lot of different financial organizations that Benjamin Winchester dealt with in it with uh, mortgaging his enslaved people, or in the case of the last two, this Reynolds and Berman, the Duke of New Orleans, they were like intermediaries that would work with financial institutions. But the one that showed up most often and from the beginning was this Consolidated Association of the Planters of Louisiana. If you never heard of it, found out it's a planter's bank where they could buy shares in it and loan money for on, on assets. So what do I do? I follow the financial thread. Luckily for me, the papers of the Consolidated Association are held here at the Louisiana State Archives. So nothing's indexed, of course, they're just papers and folders and boxes. So I started looking at all of, ben, all of the folders <laughs> and all the boxes from um, about 1820 to 1860, because that's the time frame the, when the Winchester family held these enslaved people. But his transactions began in about 1833 and ended in 1847. And I found several documents of him mortgaging people over time. That's when I found the hidden treasure. This is the document, I, I know a lot of you picked up the paper from the article from back in the, in the back when you were there, but on October 8th of 1832, there was an appraisement of value of a, about 75 enslaved people, and on this, in the, in the list of the children, there was nine-year-old Rachel indicated as dead. Now, here is a mortgage document that had been filled out with the names of all the people Benjamin Winchester was going to mortgage, but she obviously died some time before that. But he went forward with it, marking her as dead. So that for me was a fabulous find because I had a named person that I would say is born in the, is born, buried in the Buena Vista Cemetery burial site. Um, this is when we start giving humanity back to the people. Okay, this is where we start bringing specific ties of people to the land. It's not just a piece of paper. It's not just a marking on a piece of paper. There are people there. The community members know there are people there. Who are the people? Rachel's one of them. So from that hidden treasure, we, um, at the Louisiana Bucket Brigade, we, Bucket Brigade, we put out a newsletter once, twice a week. And this newsletter went out with this information about Rachel, which generated a lot of media interest. And the most provo provocative one of them was the one from, that you all picked up from that, this nine-year-old was enslaved in the U.S. Her story could help stop a chemical plant. That is powerful. 
So he goes on to give information about what her life was probably like, and then at the end he says, nearly 190 years later, community members living near the same area where the Buena Vista plantation was located, and they're fighting this Taiwanese industrial giant, and the document on racial is an important find. This is the kind of information we as genealogists are looking for. Okay. And in an unusual environment. This is so unique. I never worked in an environment like this, doing something like this with genealogy research. This is truly unique. So that happened. And the next thing, at the, kind of at the same time, I was still seeking the Winchester connection to the land. And as they had talked about before, because Gary was here as a descendant, obviously his ancestor didn't die. So where can I find him? The Freedmen's Bureau. So, but before that, I think it was on Family Search. I was looking for William Winchester in St. James Parish, and I found a um, pension card for him, the pension card for, that, for the men who went into the U.S. Army during the Civil War. And I saw that he had, and that he was, had registered in Louisiana. <laughs> William Winchester had to be the same guy. He was in um, the, uh, the Corps d'Afrique Infantry, and then later on in the U.S. Colored Troops Infantry in a couple of different regiments. So I thought, okay, the only place these records are available right now are at the National Archives in Washington, D.C. We're still in the pandemic. Can I get to the archives? I gotta find out who this guy is. They weren't really letting anybody come there. And so I started researching the Buena Vista Plantation to see if there were any other men who had gone into the Army. And I was lucky because whoever, well, Madam Winchester, who was the Benjamin's wife, he had died by this time. She was still running the plantation at that time. But whoever wrote out the notes in the remarks section, thank goodness, wrote if any of the if any of the men had actually gone into the army, and he actually gave their regiment, he gave off this information. So all I had to do was was get their information, find their pension card, the one that's similar to similar to William Winchester. Then when I was able to go to the National Archives, I could look up all these men because these pension files have so much detailed information about these men's lives, where they lived. I was hoping that they may have talked more about their life at, on the Buena Vista plantation, possibly even somebody they knew who died. You, you never know. So finally, the, the National Archives open up. I go up there. I find all these pension files about these gentlemen and got some very interesting and good information. Um, a few of them, and I have Winchesters in quotes because they went in as Amos Winchester, Caesar Winchester, so-and-so Winchester. And in one of the pension files, he said, we signed up because we were the Winchester boys. And so that's how we signed up, but that wasn't their actual last name. Amos Winchester was actually Amos Butler. Um, Caesar was actually William Caesar, that kind of thing. So, be, so because they had a different name for the pension <laughs> record, they had to get a lot of people to give affidavits to tell who they were. And all of these people give tons of information about that individual, but not enough for me to use to, use to really connect to get the information that I was looking for about the, about the Buena Vista plantation. But this was still good. So, no direct connection found yet, and I'm still working with Gary Winchester to see how we can, I don't know if he's a DNA descendant, we haven't quite figured that out yet, and he's working with somebody who is a descendant, a Winchester descendant. Um, but there may be other doc documents that we can find that can connect him, so that's ongoing. So for me, there were two prizes that came out of all of this research the cartographic research, the, the, any of the research and, and the activities that were going on beforehand and since I came on board. And the first prize was that in 2020, 2021, the Buena Vista and Acadia plantations were included in Louisiana's most endured, endangered places list. And what this does is give a wider view of what's going on here to the state and nationally so that people become aware of what's going on. All these are endangered places that they want to have preserved. And so people can now say, okay, I know what's going on there. Maybe I can aff have a firm that does ground penetrating radar that we can see what's, what may lie below the surface in these burial sites that, that they claim are there. Although in our soil, about ground penetrating radar doesn't really work that well. But you know that kind of thing where people might come and, and offer services or, or funds to help preserve these, um, these endangered places. And I have a video here, but I'm not sure. We'll see. Oh, good. 
to have for the, the Buena Vista plantation. That was one prize, but the biggest prize of all, the biggest prize of all, is a moratorium lawsuit that is filed in March of this year in New Orleans demanding a moratorium on petrochemical plants. Can't build no more. Yes. This, <laughs> this, is, yeah. this is an amazing thing coming out of these small, community organizations with help from lawyers um, out of New York and Louisiana helping them to file these lawsuits. But what they're basically saying is we have there are burial sites there. We have been we have been put upon throughout slavery, our ancestors. You all are continuing to do this by with a land use project project that concentrates petrochemical companies in the two majority black districts in St. James Parish. And when you watch this full video, and I'm sorry the, the URL didn't come out, and I'll, I'll give it to you. When you watch this full video, you will see that all the petrochemical companies are in a certain area when you get to the white majority areas. They have successfully fought against having them cited there. It's so obvious. Yeah. So this is a huge deal. and. What's happened is that the, the attorneys who put this together did this whole history of slavery. They talked about burial sites being sacred sites. They talked about, they didn't really put any information in there about me finding the Rachel document because it's one data point. You can't really make a case for one data point. But they did talk about, in section 58, they, talk, they included the information that I found about the, the men, the US color troops, who fought for this country, even though the country was not fighting for them. And so some of the work that I've been doing has been put into this moratorium lawsuit. Now where it stands is Formosa has to, um, yeah, has to reply. And they have so many lawyers, they're going to reply in some form or fashion. We don't know what it is yet, but as of right now, the kibosh has been put on them. And what we find out happening is that because so many people are talking about green energy nowadays, this petrochemical thing is slowly being eroded because people don't want to, big companies don't want to invest that much in them anymore. So they're seeing a, a bit of a backlash just from the, the economy in general, but this is from us, okay? So people have power. People have power. In the past, they didn't have, have law firms working with them. They didn't know how to access them. And that's what the Louisiana, I'm, I'm not really touting the Louisiana Bucket Bay, but that's what it, it exists for, to help bring resources to community organizers who need to fight the big fight, but they don't know how and they don't have the resources. So we connect them that way, but it's on them and they've been doing a fabulous job. So, the big prize. But, there were more hidden gems. As I keep researching, remember I said at the very beginning of my presentation that all of the conveyance books were not, um, had been taken and I hadn't been able to look for them. So. Now they're all online. So I can research them online. I find more documents and I found this one of, of Benjamin Winchester granting a mortgage on his enslaved people to Monsieur Bourgeois. And in number two you can read it says, jointly granting a mortgage on the plantation of the slaves described below to guarantee the capital of 16 shares of which the aforesaid Benjamin Winchester will be the owner. So Bourgeois wanted to divest himself of his shares that he had in the Consolidated Association Louisiana planters, and so Benjamin Winchester is mortgaging some of his property, which of course is his slaves, to be able to buy these shares and maybe something else. Well, and of course all these documents at the time were in French, so I had to get them all translated before I could figure out what really what was going on. Guess what? Four more people that I found, I hate the way this is, that I found Stanley Dead is written behind his name, 
Harry dead, Simon dead, Betsy dead, and here's Rachel again, dead. Here she's at age nine. Again, four more named individuals who, if they died on the Winchester plantation, where are they buried? There. Absolutely. We are starting to find out the names of people who were actually tied to that, line, all, that land all over their dead. But we start giving humanity to the people who were there. And we start letting these big corporations know these are sacred sites. You cannot come in and just bulldoze them and eradicate them. They have to be saved. Now, the interesting thing about this was when I saw that Rachel was on here, that made me really start thinking, what is going on here? Because this is a term that I found called corpse value of the enslaved. And I'm going to explain this to you. Now, I had the first document I had was when Benjamin Winchester purchased Rachel's family in 1828. Then the next document with Rachel was that first was that um, document that the Guardian wrote about in February of 1832, where she was appraised. Then eight nine months later in 1832, she's on this document also as dead. Why would she be on two documents months apart, indicated as dead? So I had to start researching. What could this all be about? I found an article from, written by an Amy Bride called Dead or Alive, Rachel, Ray, Racial Finance and the Corpse Value of the African American Slave Body. And she goes on to talk about how even though the enslaved people were dead, if they had been collateralized, they're still valuable. So what I'm thinking is, Rachel may have been dead, but she may have been collateralized. He may have had some financial interest in her already that he could then transfer to a new document because there was still financial value there. This is an area that I wish some academic, if you're out there or if you know somebody, could truly research and write about because I had never heard of this. It gives me the chills just to think about it. And we need to know more about what was going on with these financial institutions and slavery because they were treating people like they were just nothing and, and, and generating money off of a dead person. Help us there. So, I know, but for me and what the work I was doing, I found four more named individuals that I can now tie, now tie to the Wayne Easter Plantation. <coughs> so, in closing, I will say for me, the future is now. We're, we're, this is at the very beginning of stopping industrial development. Whatever we can do, we're going to do to stop it. And that ancestor research can be used as a fight against racial, environmental, and social injustice. And farther down the line, what we can think of is the stories and that we uncover about individuals and communities can be used to develop a, a broader cultural economy that would underpin a broader economic development in St. James Parish. And that's what we're working toward. So thank you very much. All right, everyone. Welcome back. Uh, we're going to go ahead and get started here in a minute uh, with our first afternoon speaker, uh, Katie Morless Shannon, who is a local historian and 10th, 10th generation Louisiana. She's also the author of the book, Antoine of Oak Alley. Let me get the full title. The Unlikely Origin of Pecans and the Enslaved Gardener Who Cultivated Them. A book probably of interest to anybody who enjoys pralines, pecans, pecan pie, whatever. Anyway, um, I'm going to bring up uh, Katie Morla Shannon without any further ado, please. Thanks so much for having me. Oops, let me turn this on. Okay. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really happy. Okay, can you hear me? Thanks so much for having me. I'm so happy to be here. I'm Katie Morlos Shannon, and um, my family's been here. I'm the 10th generation um, of my family to live here in Louisiana, live in Mandeville with my family, and um, originally a New Orleans native. I've worked at Laura Plantation for most of my career, which I've been a professional historian for 19 years now. I've also worked for Evergreen Plantation and Whitney Plantation, and um, my specialty is enslaved communities along the River Road between um, New Orleans and Baton Rouge. So 
I spent my childhood, probably like a lot of you, listening to my grandparents tell stories about the past, which inspired my interest in history. Um, but I was a little strange. I was kind of a strange child. I would drag my, my parents to um, historic sites. Oops. Let's see. Oops, there we go. I would make them take me to historic sites and plantations and all kinds of places that my younger siblings were reluctant to go to. So I've been doing this for a long time. I, uh, it, since the dawn of the internet when it was just message boards, you know, um, and I was about 15 when I started researching my family's genealogy. And one of the things that I realized very quickly is that my lineage was just like the um, symbolic native tree of my native land. It's like a live oak tree. It has deep roots and wide branches. Mm -hmm. And I think that as I continued to research, I saw that this is true for all families in Louisiana, particularly South Louisiana families with any kind of French heritage, with any kind of Creole background, which is my background. And when I say Creole, I don't mean a racial designation. I'm talking about descendants of the first settlers here, be, they, be you black or white or anywhere in between. And I'm gonna tell you right now, we're all interconnected. That's one of the things that my research has shown me. We're, we're all interconnected, and that's kind of what drew me to my research, is that I think it's really important to acknowledge that, and we cannot tell the story of South Louisiana by just talking about one group of people. We're all interconnected, our stories cannot be told separately, we have to come together, and we also, as Miss Lenora, showed us we need to come together to advocate for our state and for our histor for historic preservation. So that's a little bit about me. This is at Evergreen Plantation. Um, and Miss Lenora showed you the video where they show the cabins, the quarters at Evergreen, which are among the last remaining slave quarters in the exact location where they were. And this is one of the LA's of oaks they have there. Now, let's see. OK. so. This is my great-grandmother. Her name was Bertha Duet. She grew up not far from where Miss Lenora was talking about in her presentation. Miss Lenora was talking about St. James Parish. Well, right across the river, my great-grandmother and great-grandfather grew up in a community called Paulina and Lutcher. And in fact, they talked a lot like Miss LeBeouf in the video that Miss Lenora showed with that cadence, okay, and that river parish kind of accent. They're white, and Miss LeBeouf is black. But guess what? They share a common ancestry and a common heritage, which is what, again, I think y'all know, and, and my research has turned out. So my granny lived till I was about 15 years old. I was quite close to her. And I was researching my Douay family roots and I knew a little bit about it, but honestly, I know more about the things I research for plantations and, and historic sites than I do about my own family at this point, because you know, you do what you're hired to do, right? Well, one day I was looking at a man named Alan Duet, who is the gentleman in the middle, had posted about one of his ancestors, and it got me questioning and thinking. And I already knew that I, had people in my family tree who were of all different backgrounds and racial heritage, but I couldn't, I hadn't pinpointed exactly where. So Alan and I talked, and it turns out that my great grandmother's great grandfather, his name was Jacques Douay Jr., he was the overseer on his mother's small plantation in St. John the Baptist Parish, starting around 1850. And he was the father of a child, several children actually, with an enslaved woman named Edwige Duplanchet. Edwige Duplanchet came from the plantation further down the river, a few away from his. She was a domestic servant there. He had his white family, he had his black family, they grew up in the same communities together, some of them shared the same names. So that's one branch of that family. Albert Douay, whom you see on the far right, is descended from them. He's one of Alan's ancestors, and um, both my grandmother, my great grandmother, and Mr. Albert represent Douay ancestry. Now, another branch 
came from Jacques Douay, who I, whom I was just talking about, the overseer on his mother's plantation, his uncle. His uncle, Zephyrin Douay, had a relationship or an encounter with an enslaved woman on his mother's plantation, which resulted in a man named Everest Douay. He joined the United States Colored Troops in the Civil War and went on to have a son, several, several children. One of the sons was Furman Douay, he's in the middle, and then his son Blaze went on to medical school in Iowa and came back to St. John and St. James parishes as a doctor to serve his community. So this is all meant to show that the narrative that we get in school is far more complex than the reality of when we sit down and do our family genealogy or our family history, okay? And it's actually, oops, sorry. Okay, so that leads us to, oops, nope, I went to, how do you go back? Y'all, we're gonna have more technical difficulties. Just back arrow. <laughs> back arrow at the bottom. Of the screen, just on the keyboard. Oh, okay, so this leads us to the fact that there are many misconceptions, right? As Mr. Um, Mr. Lash was um, referencing earlier, it, there were these misconceptions that it's virtually impossible to trace the genealogy of enslaved people, you're gonna always hit a brick wall, the records don't exist, you know, you've heard all of those things, right? When the reality is the information is there if you know how to access it and research it. It's not always, but, but there's more than you think. And it requires commitment and tenacity. So Louisiana genealogy is particularly unique in that we have this rich Creole heritage that I was just talking about, but we're also very different than the rest of America, than the rest of the United States with the Anglo-American background. We have this Creole heritage, makes us more like the Caribbean colonies of French and, uh, French and Spanish colonies. So we have a notarial system, which means we can find bills of sales of enslaved people in the notarial records, and they're very easily accessed and found compared to the rest of the South. We also have sacramental records. So because this area was Catholic from the very beginning, you were required to baptize enslaved people in the Catholic Church. So if the person who enslaved your ancestors was Catholic, you're going to find those records in the diocese archives or the archdiocesan archives. And then we, we were of a civil law background as opposed to the common law and the rest of the Anglo-American United States. So you had this Napoleonic code. So when people died, it was more likely to have this a succession filed and be probated and the property divided because women could inherit. And it was inheritance laws covered the entire sibling group as opposed to just the oldest, right? It was not the law of primogeniture. So this makes Louisiana special. This makes our heritage special and it makes genealogy here a little bit easier than in the rest of the United States. Um, so that was what I was just talking about, um, the different notarial system and sacramental records. This is actually a copy of um, a baptismal register from uh, involving enslaved people from Laura Plantation. The priest would come out from the church because the plantation at the time was quite a ways from the church, and he would come out and baptize large groups of enslaved children at once. So this is, and it's also pointing out that it's written in French. So this is another element of Louisiana genealogy that can be difficult because many of the documents are in French. A few are in Spanish, and those are particularly hard, um, and you'll typically find those in the notarial archives, but for the most part, French. So that's another thing you have to navigate and know. Now, I work for Laura Plantation, and at Laura, we have worked with the descendants 
of people who had been enslaved on the plantation. So Miss Mary is one of those descendants, and she, I found her family tree online on Ancestry.com, and I saw that it matched up with people that we were researching at Laura, and I reached out to her and her family. They came out to Laura, and we sat down with them, and we handed them the information that we had researched and found on her family, and she exchanged information with us. So these are some of her ancestors, their parents, were born into, or their mother was born into slavery at Laura Plantation in St. James Parish. And that's one of the things, one of the ways we feel as, at Laura that we can give back to the community and really make it so that um, people understand that this is not just a plantation in the stereotypical way you think of a plantation. This is a heritage site where we're working with the community to try to bring about an understanding of the history and the past. So Miss Mary had lived in Vashery her whole life, but she didn't know which plantation her family had come from until I contacted her. And from there, we were, we were able to work together and exchange information. And it's been a wonderful uh, relationship with her and with many other people. So how do you do this? How do you do this with your own family? I'm gonna tell a story about a man that we researched at Laura, and then I'm gonna tell you how we did it so that you can do it too. Now, this is Mr. Lloyd Cooper. Mr. Lloyd died, unfortunately, about a year or two ago. But if he had come to me saying, I wanna know my family history, where do I start? I would have said, well, what do you have? And one of the things he would have had was the obituary published in the newspaper for his father, Junius, Junius Cooper. From there, I knew who Junius' parents were. I would have seen that his mother was named Susan Grow. And that would have alerted me to the fact that Susan Grow, who was born just after slavery, just around emancipation from Laura Plantation, at Laura Plantation, that he was one of the people descended from and people who had been enslaved at Laura. So from there, I could take that obituary, the information I found there, and then work backward. So Susan Grow is in this picture. You can see her. She was a domestic house servant. She was born around 1870, so her parents had been enslaved at Laura. She was born free, but she lived in the household with the DuPark and LaCool family that owned Laura Plantation. And at that point, we were able to then trace her through census records. And we knew who her parents were. And her father, in particular, was someone who was very important on the plantation. His name was Edward Grow. And we know a great deal about her father, Edward. He was not a house servant. He worked at the sugar mill. Later in life, he became the sugar maker on the plantation, which was a very elite position because the sugar maker was kind of like a scientist almost and um, a very skilled worker. He had to know when the right time was for granulation. He had to understand the operations of the sugar mill and um, the, the science behind making sugar. But before that, he was um, a blacksmith. Um, he was born at Laura Plantation around 1835. He, he was baptized on the plantation. Remember I showed you that baptismal record with all the, the children's names in French? He was one of those children baptized in that group baptism um, in 1841. He was six years old. And it, it let us know in the baptismal record that his mother's name was Melanie. So. What you will encounter in documents about enslaved people is you will often see their mother's name because young children under the age of 10 were listed with their mothers in South Louisiana or in Louisiana, but not their fathers. So we knew who his mother was. We knew Melanie was his mother and through that we knew who his siblings were because later we could trace Melanie's children after they were baptized. But unfortunately we didn't know his father. Um, and actually, I misspoke, he was, he was a brick mason. That's another thing we knew about him. So he was a brick mason, and when he was apprenticing and learning how to become a brick mason, he lost part of his thumb. We also know that in 1852, in the inventory, 
that was made at the time of death of one of the plantation owners, he was valued at around $900. At that point, he was older, so he was no longer listed with his mother. Now, Edward joined the Union Army. So think, imagine it's, it's 1862, and New Orleans has fallen to the United States Army, and the Confederacy has backed out of New Orleans and South Louisiana and gone up to North Louisiana. And the federal gunboats are coming down the river and taking over the plantation areas, and they're liberating the enslaved people there. The enslaved men around Edward's age began to enlist in the Union Army and fight for their freedom, which is not a story that you hear often. We're all familiar with the movie Glory and the Massachusetts free men of color who fought, but what we don't know is that the first men of color to fight were right here in Louisiana. They were free men of color in the Corps d'Afri. And then that became, they had two regiments of that. Then they started the third regiment and it was open to enslaved people. So um, Edward joined the third regiment of the Louisiana Native Guard, it was later, later called the Corps d'Afri. He and quite a few men from the plantation ran away, enlisted in New Orleans, and they fought. Now, they fought at the Battle of Port Hudson. Just up river from here, it was the last stronghold on the Mississippi River, Vicksburg and Port Hudson. They were among the last. And the Union wanted control of the Mississippi River, so they were trying to break that siege. And the 75th, which is what he would later be, it, the regiment was renamed the 75th United States Colored Infantry. They fought at Port Hudson, they proved their worth. And after that, many men went on to enlist in the United States Colored Troops. When Edward enlisted, he did not have a surname, and of course, for military documents, you're required to give your last name. He gave the name Dupark because that was the name of his, of his owner. He didn't know what else to say. So he was known as Edward Dupark on military records. And during that time, um, he experienced some deafness from the exploding um, shells. And he also lost some teeth from biting cartridges. Now, he, after his time in the Army, he returned to the plantation. He married a woman named Eliza Skinner, who had been sold south from Virginia through the domestic slave trade, and they had their daughter, Susan. So we knew all of this about him, still didn't know who his father was. One of the wonderful things, the special things about Edward is that he received a pension for his military service. In 1890, the government began issuing pensions to veterans who, of the Civil War. And you had to fill out an application, you had to have a disability, our um, old age could count, and you would fill out an application and then receive a pension for your service. But the problem was that Edward and men like him didn't have a birth certificate. They hadn't had really any written documents about themselves. Uh, other than your, their name listed in an inventory, they had no proof, proof of identity. So they would send out inspectors or agents from the federal government to interview Edward's friends and neighbors and family members to be sure that he was who he said he was, that he was the man who fought in the 75th. And they interviewed all these people. So I received his pension file from the National Archives, and I'm going through it. And it says, he's the son of Philippe, Philippe Grow. Well, I knew who that was because from the moment I set foot at Laura when I was 21 years old and took the tour, they had been talking about Philippe since they opened. Philippe, Laura writes about him. Laura of the Laura Plantation namesake, she wrote about her time on the plantation as a young girl. And one of her memories was an old man named Philippe who had been enslaved there. And she stopped and talked with him when they were by the well one day. And she asked what had happened to his forehead. And he said, that was where they branded me for running away. And on his forehead were the initials of her great-grandmother. And I knew 
that was Philippe, because that's the only Philippe we have in the inventory, and it, the ages all added up. That was his father. So from there, you have to think about this. We have Philippe. We, this is his, um, his father's purchase record. He was sold to Laura's great-grandmother, Nanette Dupart, on July 13, 1816, by Nathaniel Cox, who had purchased him from a ship's captain in Baltimore. He was brought out to the sugarcane plantation, from which he ran away multiple times. He was considered a habitual runaway, for which he was branded with hot iron, like cattle. There's the runaway ad that ran in the newspaper about it. Now think about the fact that his son ran away from the plantation, joined the Union Army, fought for his freedom, gained it, and then had the right to vote, rose to the highest position on the plantation. He was the sugar maker there. That's just, that's the power of this kind of research. You can find stories like that. And what I'm so often reminded is these are not characters in a book. These are not people on a TV show. These are real human beings. And that's, that's, I think, the most compelling thing about this kind of research and about the research that you do about your family members. These are real people to you, and these are real people to me. So Edward's story is told multiple times every day at Laura Plantation in the tour. How do we, do, how do we know all of this? Where do we gain all this information from for his story? Well, we have his pension record which we sent off to the National Archives in Washington, D.C. for. We have his baptismal record from the Diocese of Baton Rouge archives. We have inventories that were found at the St. James Parish Courthouse, as well as in the New Orleans Notarial Archives. We have his military service record from Fold 3 online. We have the Freedmen's Bureau records that have his wife's information and his parents' information on them from Family Search and from other um, resources where you can find Friedman's Bureau records. We have census records on him. We have some newspaper accounts that talk about him. And as I said before, Laura's memoirs mention his father. Oh, and the, um, the picture of the sugar mill, he was one of the guys standing in front of it. That is a picture of the Laura Plantation sugar mill, and he was one of the, the men in front. So you can see the top is his military record, and on the bottom, there he is, written into the 1852 inventory that was taken at the time of death of one of his owners, one of the men who enslaved him. So where do you start? You need to start with the basics, write down as far back as you can go to your grandparents or your great-grandparents. Talk to the people, the elders in your community, your grandparents or great-grandparents, if you still have them. Note where they lived and an approximate date of birth. If you can't do that, kind of subtract back from you, where you are. So, and you can even be as nonspecific as just a state or region. But that gives you a basis from which to start. So just draw a basic it does not have to be anything fancy, just a scratched out sheet of paper with a basic family tree. And that's how you can start. So you need a family search account or an Ancestry.com account. You can access Ancestry.com for free through the library or you can make your own. Family search is free, but it can be a little cumbersome because you do have to wade through a lot of the records page by page. Most of them are not indexed. Ancestry has kind of a better searchability quality to it. Um, you're gonna start with census records because those are kind of the easiest to navigate and the ones most likely to have your ancestors present on them. And those will provide you with the basics, name, ages, dates of birth, places of residence, family members and occupations. So you need to note all of that down. Now, there are limitations with census records, particularly for enslaved people and their descendants. The first census in which formerly enslaved people appear wasn't until 1870. Prior to that, the only censuses that dealt with the enslaved were called slave schedules, and they were listed statistically, not by name. So you would find the, the person who enslaved them, their name, 
and it would just list like a number next to how many five-year-old boys they owned, okay? Uh, it can still be useful, but it's not going to give you pinpoint for you a name. Another thing to keep in mind that I've experienced during my work at Evergreen and um, Laura is that some people were skipped over in 1870, at least in the river parishes in Louisiana, there can be some gaps. So just keep that in mind. Even if they're not there physically in the written record, they may still be there on the plantation, but not listed. I've come across that. Something else to know, the 1890 census, if you can't find it, it's because it doesn't exist. It was destroyed in a fire. Now, this is Susan Grow on the 1900 census, and this is just an example of what a census record might look like. Um, so this is Edward's daughter and her family in 1900. So you're gonna work backwards. Start with 1950 or 1940, find your closest relatives and move backwards through time with the information that you learn. You want to start broad and then narrow it down. You may know for sure in your mind that your family came from Convent, Louisiana, but what if that year someone related to you went to New Orleans to work for a little while? Broaden your scope so that you're, you're sure to find them. If you only searched in Convent, you would miss them. Now write down everything you find, because some of it may seem irrelevant, but is in fact important. They could have borders in their household that are actually not borders at all, but their cousins who pay them money to, to live with them, a little rent. So that could lead you to grandparents. Sometimes you won't be able to find the person you're looking for by the name you think is theirs. They might be going by a middle name, a nickname, or the census taker may have written it down phonetically or put it down wrong. Another thing to keep in mind is that a lot of enslaved people and their descendants did not get formal educations right away, so they may not have been literate and known how to properly write out the correct spelling of their names as we think of them today. There could even be transcription errors, so you can, there are workarounds with brick walls. You can look for a sibling and then locate the, the grandparent's family. Try other avenues to get where you want to go. <coughs> All right, this is just kind of something I've noticed. When you log into Ancestry.com, the first homepage that comes up asks you to input the person's name and where they, they were, it's, um, how do they put it, it's like lived in, okay? You want to go to advanced search. Don't input right on the homepage. Go to advanced search. Put under lived in where they lived, and that'll give you a better search. So that's just... And, and, and with advanced search, you can put in more information too, and it can kind of help you from there. So there are other things, once you've done that, that can help you with your, with your search. Newspapers.com and genealogybank.com are great sources for obituaries, and they can also show things like if your ancestor paid taxes for that year, if they're on that list, if they owned property or bought and sold things, if they were involved in, the, uh, in um, a kind of trial or a lawsuit, things like that. It'll also help you with possible locations. Now, Louisiana didn't begin issuing death records until 1914. These indices are available online at the Secretary of State um, search, and you can do um, a scroll through. And New Orleans, however, has always issued death certificates, and those are um, available on Family Search. You can find them there. Um, you can also send off to the state archives for all of these. And of course, the Catholic Church was um, issuing funeral records, sacramental records. Birth records were not issued until 1911. And you can find an index of those on Ancestry.com or on the Louisiana State Archives website. And then marriages, of course, during slavery, enslaved people were not legally allowed to marry. So you're not going to find records for that. 
In the mid to late 1860s, that's when you're going to start seeing marriage records. And you will see lots of them because as soon as they got the chance to go and marry, they did so. And they understood the importance of legitimizing their family under the law for inheritance purposes and for pensions that they would receive later, things like that. And their church communities also required, a lot of them required them to be married. And they were wanting to adhere to those rules of the church community. So you're going to find lots of those. Um, Ancestry.com and Family Search also have indices. And the marriage records themselves for individual parishes are all housed in their clerk of court's office. Few are digitized. This is of Clarice Wilson and Austin Wilson who were enslaved at Laura. And it was their marriage record of the, ba of the Baptist minister performed their ceremony. So what about during slavery? Because as we pointed out, there's a gap right, between what we know from 1865 forward and what went on 1865 and back. And we have lots of records on both sides, but it's connecting them. The hard fact of the matter is you have to know the names of who enslaved the people in your family. That will be key to unlocking everything. Now, there are ways to do this. You need to kind of have an approximate idea of where they were enslaved. Oftentimes, this will be the same place they lived in after freedom because many, in fact, most did not go far. So you want to start there and look around at the area in which they lived. Find the names of the large plantations in the area. Start with that. From there, you can look at slave schedules of that area, that ward, in the census records. See who ins the names of enslaved people, uh, the people who enslaved people, the white owners, and write down their names. You can look on maps like Norman's chart or the Persac map and see the plantations that were in that area at the time of slavery. Write those down. You can also look at parish histories or, or at the parish library. I'm sure the librarians would be very glad to help you with, with histories. Um, you know, with, with historic plantation homes. And I know that y'all pointed out the names do change. So that is something to keep in mind. But if you can find a starting point, use that. Okay, Freedman's Bureau of Records also help to narrow it down. There are two important documents you'll find. The agreement with the Freedmen, which is when the plantation owner was forced by the United States government to pay the workers who were living on the plantation, they came up with an agreement contractually. If you are to live here and work here, here's the things, the rules you have to abide by. They had their names all written down. It's the first time you'll see a first or last name for a lot of people. Unfortunately, some of them, it's still just a first name. Payroll records as well. It's the, the same kind of concept. These are about 1865. So they'll have a name and an age. They'll have the plantation owner's name, and a parish. That gives you a starting point. Then go to 1870 or 1880 census. Look at who's living around your ancestors. Find who the white owner of the property is or who uh, the, the name of the plantation closest and use that too. So now you have some, you may not know for sure, right? But you have some idea. You have a list of candidates. And you can use that. So this is an example of an agreement with the freedmen. This is for Laura Plantation. You'll see they have their name, their age, and then their class of laborer and how much money they made. And the top part is saying things about if you are to live on this plantation, you may not own a weapon. You cannot own a horse or a buggy. It's basically showing how restrictive the labor system was after the Civil War. It was still very much like an indentured servitude, unfortunately. So once you have that information, you've narrowed it down to um, a list of people who possibly enslaved your ancestors, which I hate saying out loud, that sounds terrible, but you, this, is, this is the reality here. You go to the courthouse and you look through the probate records. This is where, you know, you hear about slave inventories with their names all listed. This is where you'll find them and you're gonna find them listed in succession and probate records. So when an owner of a plantation died, they oftentimes would take an inventory of all of that person's property. So this included land and horses and cows, as well as 
plantation tools and implements and enslaved people. And it's going to have their names, their dates of birth, their estimated value, because they would have what was essentially an appraisal. And then you can even recreate family groups, because the mothers will typically be listed with their children. There are some times where it's digitized now on FamilySearch or Ancestry.com, so you can get lucky and find them there. They're also available um, at the Notarial Archives, the New Orleans Public Library, or your local clerk of courts office. This is an example of one of them. So this is the 1852 inventory at Laura because one of the owners, Louis Duparc, had died and he shared that property with his siblings so they had to take an inventory in order to properly split up the property. And you'll see, see Dilsey, 55 years old, and her child, um, who was 10, and Mathilde, 38, and her child, Rosalie, 9. So that helps you. You can see how now you can start to recreate family trees after the war. Sacramental records. These can also be tricky, but again, it's you take the location of where your ancestor was enslaved, or at least the general area. Find the Catholic Church associated with that area, and then go to the diocese or archdiocese archives. So Baton Rouge has a diocese with an archi the archi archival holdings of their diocese. New Orleans is an archdiocese. It has its own archival holdings. Homa Thibodeau has theirs. So it's divided up like that. It's going to, the, typically, the people will be listed, the enslaved people will be listed based upon who enslaved them, once again. So if you go through baptismal records, you'll find, like, uh, Philomene, um, enslaved, uh, or sl uh, slave of, fill in the blank's name. <coughs> and if it's the approximate date of yours, write it down. You know you're getting closer, you're on to something. And that's the same with the funeral records. So unfortunately, there are gaps, and this is, this is of course only, typically only applicable to Catholic owners and enslaved Catholics. There are also some gaps. Some priests were not as vigilant about recording these things, and some were just lost. But it is a treasure trove. It's what I've found to be the best resource for recreating families, and it's, per, for me, one of my favorite resources and ways to research. Now, sale records. The domestic slave trade was ex of extreme importance to Louisiana. One million people were forcibly transported from the Upper South to the Lower South between 1810 and 1860. New Orleans had the largest slave market in North America. So this was big business, and as Ms. Lenora pointed out, it was big, big business to lots of people, not just plantation owners. To the banking industry, it, it fed the city's coffers with taxes, um, doctors who treated them, people who clothed them. This was a major industry. And the bill of sales were all registered at the New Orleans Notarial Archives. So once again, you have to start with the name of the ens enslaver, the person who did the purchasing. And you will go to the Land Records Division in the New Orleans Notarial Archives. They, they have indices, indexes, starting in 1825. And you search by name of the person who did the purchasing. Prior to 1825, there are indexes, but it's by notary. So you have to go through individual notaries to find them. You can also, someone brought up Gwendolyn Midlow Hall's database. She looked through a lot of those records and put them online. And that's at ibiblio.org. Conveyance records and clerk of courts offices also have bills of sale. Unfortunately, they can be a little spotty. Some of them have indices. And once again, you have to search by the enslaver's name. The ship manifests can also be very interesting and off sometimes reveal things you don't realize. So if you find, say, Bill's sale record and you see who sold Bill and you find him on a ship being transported to New Orleans by that slave trader, you notice somebody else may have his same last name on the ship and suddenly you have potential for siblings. Okay, 
So it can kind of open up another avenue, uh, another means of inquiry, if you will. In 1829, around 1829, people were required to report from whom they purchased enslaved people from Virginia and the Carolinas. You may get lucky and find something like that, and it can point you back there. It's difficult to trace all the way back to Virginia. Um, part of what Miss Lenora was talking about, about the enslaved people who were being buried on the plantations in the river parishes, was because they were coming from Virginia and the Carolinas, where they were Protestants. So they were not going to be buried on holy ground. They were going to be a uh, Catholic holy ground. They were going to be buried on the plantation. They often had their own preachers in the quarters who would conduct the funeral services for them. And that's why you don't have the, you're not going to find those in the Catholic records. You're not going to find funerals in the Catholic records for them because they were Protestant. All right, so databases. Gwendolyn Midlow Halls, we talked about, she only deals in the colonial era and the very early statehood area, so it's going to be kind of limited. Um, Evergreen Plantation has a database online. I made it. It's not perfect. Nothing I do is perfect. You can probably tell from the presentation, but I try. So, it's over 400 people were enslaved there. It's searchable. Oak Alley has a very good uh, database that I used when writing my book, Antoine of Oak Alley. Herman Grimma House in New Orleans has just come out with one. We have one, a spreadsheet kind of database at Laura. It's not online, but if you contact us, we will look. That's me, so I will do it. Um, Whitney Plantation has inventories available online, a few. Now, here's some pitfalls. I'm going to see where I am in my notes. So some pitfalls can be, the ancestry hints can be very good because they can lead you somewhere, or sometimes they, if you're looking at someone else's family tree, they may not be properly sourced. So they might be putting up information that they haven't verified. So you want to always make sure there's a source behind what is put up before you add it to your own tree. Keep in mind there can also be flaws in the census record. They could write, mishear a name, write it down, miss a child, write down the wrong age for whatever reason. So just because you see something in the census record does not 100% make it gospel. When you hit a brick wall, take a step back from that particular individual and turn and focus on a different one. I guarantee you you'll find a bunch more information on that one, and then you can come back with fresh eyes on the next. Okay, this is really important. This is, I think, if you listen to anything, listen to this. Evolution of names. Names of the enslaved changed. After, their, their, their names they used before slavery, their names that were then used after slavery. There was the name that their enslaver, the master gave them, that's written down. There might have been the name they had in Africa. Then there might be a name their mama called it. There might be a name they prefer that their friend went by. Then after slavery ended and they had to take a surname, what were they going to choose? Many of them went with their father's first name as their surname. Okay? So like your father's John. I would become Katie John. Well then over time it might evolve to Katie John's son because I'm the son of John, you see? Names evolved. Keep that in mind. Your ancestor might have one surname on the 1870 census and a different one in 1880. Doesn't mean it's two different people necessarily. Keep that in mind because the names evolved and changed. Age is just a number, sorta. They did not have birth certificates. They did not have written documents. They didn't know their birthdays, okay? So they didn't have calendars marking down the years. Give them a decade. Give them, give them wiggle room. I've seen things uh, tw uh, between 15 to 20 years off even because the woman was married to a much older man. Things like that. Assumptions made by census takers. Keep that in mind. Language. You have often here in Louisiana a Creole population dealing with Anglo-American people. So they're going to write down what Anglo-Americans would go by, not by what Creoles would say. Okay. So like Everest, Everest Douay, who I was talking about in the beginning, part of my family, 
when he enlisted in the Union Army, he said that. They wrote him down as John Coupard, because that was a name they could write. Had nothing to do with his name, it was just a name they come, came up with, they put him down for. You're gonna find things like that. Um, there are corruptions of Creole names that you're gonna see in records, because they didn't speak French. So keep in mind the language barrier. Memories can be very flawed. They can be very off. But there's always usually a, gr a grain of truth. Oral histories matter, and typically there's some grain of truth to them. So ask your elders and your community and see what they have to say. Also, you may have someone in your family too who is a free person of color. There will be more records on them. They will be researched differently somewhat than you do your enslaved ancestors. And just keep that in mind. You may turn that up. Now, here's an example of a name, Alfred Harrison. 1864, he enlists in the Union Army, he's Thomas Alfred. 1870, he's Alfred Thomas on the census. One year later when he gets married, the Baptist minister writes him as Alfred Harry. Next census, he's Alfred Harrison. By 1900, he's Alfred Harris. This is all one man, I promise you. I have all the source citations for it. This is his grandson. And he was um, enslaved on Armont, right next to Laura Plantation. Clemence. Clemence was the daughter of the master of Laura Plantation and an enslaved house servant named Henriette. Clemence appears in the 1870 census as Clemence Zenon because her mother had married a man named Frederick Zenon. Zeno, they would say. So she's under her stepfather's name. 1880, she got married. She's Clemence Thayard. That's her married name. In 1885, on her daughter's baptismal certificate, she's Clemence Flagy, because Flagy Duparc was her father. So she's Clemence Flagy. 1900, what happened to her first name? Y'all, Clementine is the American version of Clemence. All right? There's going to be your ancestor's French name, and they're going to have their American name a lot of times. 1911. Her son's death certificate. She's Clementine Dupar because, again, her daddy's Flashy Dupar. And then on her death certificate, she's Mrs. Teofield Teo. All right? It's all one woman. It's her. But you have to follow the trail. You have to be creative. You have to understand that they were being creative. They were learning their way. This was this Western society kind of surname idea. They didn't have that. This was something they were adopt, adapting to. Plus then they were also French Creole. So that was another difference from the Anglo-American heritage that they were being um, you know, forced to adhere to. All right, 23andMe published a study in the American Journal of Human Genetics in 2020 with a sampling of 50,000 people. And what it found, was that enslaved workers brought to the Americas were disproportionately male. They wanted strong, young men to work in the plantation, in the fields, all right, in the, on the plantations. However, when you look at the genetic data, it shows that enslaved women contributed to gene pools at a higher rate of about 1.5 to two times more than African men. This is proving without, we, this is proving something we already know. We all knew this if we had our eyes and ears open. The DNA shows it, which is that uh, generations of women of color were raped and sexually exploited by white males. And this is, this is the horrific truth. So blood doesn't lie, but it also doesn't talk. You may find people you're related to, particularly white ancestors you're related to, you won't know how. That's common. Sometimes the white ancestor, the, the white descendants who are on Ancestry.com will work with you. Sometimes they won't. That's, that's part of it. But DNA is the next frontier in this kind of research. And if you, I, I would encourage you to get that done. Um, now, Another big question I get, can we assume if we have a mixed racial background that the enslaver is our ancestor? It's quite likely. It's the most likely assumption, but it's not always that simple. This is Victoria 
Bakunin. Her father, Frederick, was enslaved at Evergreen Plantation. He was the son of a domestic enslaved woman and the overseer of the plantation. Next door on Whitney Plantation, there was a family of Webbers. They were the children of the owner. The owner was a woman, her brother-in-law, who also lived on the plantation with her. We have my ancestor, who was an overseer on his mama's plantation and went down the road to another plantation and had a relationship with a woman there. It's never as simple as you think. It, is it the person who enslaved them? Likely. But are there other options? There are many. Because in that society, women of color did not have the right to consent. That's the reality of it. So, if you have the, this is the happy news. If you find that you are descended from a person who served in the United States colored troops, it is quite likely that they apply for a pension. And you can go on Fold 3 online and get their military records, and you can go and get their pension files from the National Archives. There's a co there are companies that will pull the records for you and get them to you faster than the National Archives even will, okay? And I think you've heard a lot about what they can tell you, which is a whole life story of a person. Now, real quick, this is another example of, do you see the picture? Are they, are they, it's the same picture, only it's undergone conservation. This picture sat in the basement of the New Orleans Museum of Art until it was deacquisitioned and sold to fund Noma's continuing collection and purchasing. It got into private hands. And then a collector contacted me and said, I want to know who the children are and I want to know who the black child is. And I said, I've never done anything like that, but I'll try. It was fascinating. So we had a few clues. The dress told us that it was about the 1830s, the clothing they were wearing. We also knew who donated it. It was a woman named Audrey Hess. She said, oh, it was one of my French ancestors. Maybe the name was Pastor. So I did some digging. She was living with her great aunt, Alice Pasteur, this, this little, when she was a little girl. Her mother was Sarah Hess, whose mother was Georgina Pasteur. And from there, I thought, oh, it's the Pasteur family? No, dead end, dead end, dead end. It was the mother. It was the mother's family. Her great-grandmother, the Theodora Fry. Theodora Fry was the daughter of a woman named Corley Donwa who was a, a, from an elite Creole family in New Orleans, and she had married a German banker named Frederick Fry. And in 1837, they commissioned this painting to be done of their children with their enslaved domestic servant. I figured out who the white children were first. I didn't know if I could figure out who the black child was, but then something about the name rang a bell. I was working for Evergreen Plantation at the time, and there had been a sale to the owner of Evergreen Plantation by a woman named Coralie Donwa Fry in 1857. And the person sold was named Belizaire. He was a mulatto of mixed racial background. He was a domestic, meaning he worked in the house. He was the right age. And I thought, could this be him? Well, to prove it, I had to trace the provenance. I had to go back, um, almost as if you're doing a title search on a house, Horrible to say, but that's the way the process works. And you go through and find the bills of sale. And I was able to find when Frederick Fry first purchased him in um, 1828, he purchased him from a free woman of color in New Orleans who had purchased him from Joseph Trebino in 1822 when he was just a few months old. He was born on St. Peter Street in the French Quarter in New Orleans. And at some point, he was covered up. We don't know when and we don't know why. We can take some educated guesses with that, I think. But this is Belazare. The trail for him currently ends at Evergreen Plantation where he was a domestic enslaved laborer. The latest I can find on him is 1860. The Civil War came, created a lot of chaos, and as I told you, a lot of people reinvented themselves in many different ways, including by name. So if this can be done, anything can be done. So take that to heart. 
And this was, this was the woman who donated the painting. Here I found him on a ship manifest where he was accompanying the uh, Frederick Fry. This was the home he was born in. And this is Evergreen Plantation Slave Quarters, which still exists today and where he would have lived. Now, my book, Antoine of Oak Alley, I was told you can't write a biography about an enslaved man. How are you going to fill up an entire book about that? Well, I did. But part of how I did it was because I didn't just tell his story. I told the story of the community in which he was born and raised. And that will give you an idea about your own ancestors, what they would have went through. It tells all about the life on a sugarcane plantation here in Louisiana, South Louisiana. And my next project is going to involve children, um, women of who were born to white fathers, enslaved mothers, who after marrying white men, during the time in which interracial marriage was illegal in Louisiana, which was from about 1868 up to 1894, they legally married, but then their children could not because the anti-miscegenation laws passed in 1894. And then by 1908, the concubinage laws passed, which said we can't live together, we can't even cohabit black and white, okay? That was how stringent these laws were, and they disrupted many families, including this one, the Von Buelos. He was the son of a prince, or um, a cousin of a prince in Germany, and she was a free woman of color here. And uh, that's what my next book with LSU Press will be about. So thank you so much. I appreciate it, and um, it's been a pleasure to talk with you. Good luck at your church. Our next speaker is Rachel Swarns, who is a professor at New York University, a writer uh, for the New York Times, and uh, probably many other things besides. Um, her re most recent book is The 272, which she's going to talk about today. I highly recommend this book. She combines the research of an academic, the prose of a journalist, and the emotional impact of a novelist, all in this one little book. We have two copies, well, oh, we just have one copy left to check out right now. It's also available on Libby, but there's a bit of a wait if you want to read a digital copy. So, uh, I, there's nothing more I can say that she can't. So please, let's welcome Rachel Swarn. Okay. All right, can you hear me? Yes, it sounds like you can. Um, well, first of all, thank you so much uh, for that kind introduction. I am really, really happy to be here. Someone got the book, that's great. <laughs> A couple of folks. Um, really thrilled to be here. Um, and I've seen some familiar faces already, um, which is wonderful. And um, just thank you all. Thank you all for being here. What I'm hoping to do today is to walk you through um, how I got started on this journey, uh, what I learned, and a bit about um, the records that I relied on to illuminate the lives of the people um, who I write about, and, um, and also about what this history means to us as Americans, here and now. I'm gonna share some photos uh, with you because I'm a journalist, so the visuals matter, so I gotta share some photos. Um, and then I'm hoping that, um, I, I'd love to hear your questions and your thoughts. Oh, that's okay. Ah, there we go. Okay. Um, I'd love to hear your questions and your thoughts um, because this is history that uh, we need to engage with. Uh, this is history that we need to grapple with together. <coughs> Um, as as a community and and as a country. Um, and I must Thank you all. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you very much. That was really amazing. Um, Wow, this is really a success. I want to thank you all for coming and making this a great success. I really appreciate it. And uh, let's all thank Sarah here, who's been pushing the button. <laughs> um, yeah.
that's all that we have for today. Uh, you're welcome to visit us upstairs. Uh,